this God whom we serve desires us. It is indeed humbling. And so tonight I thank God for what he has placed in the prophet's heart to do as he prepares us and he brings us to that place where we grow in faith and we grow in the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the word of God. And so tonight I want to recognize him for having, you know, taken, you know, the that place and, you know, allowing the Holy Spirit to use him. Prophet, thank you so very much. Tonight we are continuing with our word, our study of the word sanctification, our study of what the word itself stands for, what it means when we use the term sanctification. We are going right back or continuing from where we last um, stopped. Last week we looked at a definition and we, in our definition, we went back to our text, which was taken from the book of John 17, 17, which says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And when we looked into the, the you know, what the word was saying to us, what Jesus was saying when he prayed that prayer, it was a prayer of Jesus for the apostles of the day unto the Father. And I believe that since Jesus remains the intercessor who intercedes on our behalf daily, and he prayed this prayer then, this prayer still holds significance and it is still for us now. And so when he prayed that prayer, what Jesus was simply saying, Lord, let the very power of that word be what will be used to separate the men whom you are given to me and by extension those who are his today and so jesus prayed the, the prayer and today we are thankful that we are sanctified by the power of that word that works in our hearts and it is to be set apart naturally for the wisdom the knowledge understanding of who our father is and so tonight we return as we briefly look at the definition that was given for sanctification. It was said that God's transformative grace upon an individual's life in preparation for his holy design and intent. Basically, God is transforming us and it is his grace upon us that permits that transformation. That transformation, it is really and truly that we will ascend to a place of holiness, that we begin to resemble God in all dimensions of his character. And that holiness unto which we will be ascribing or ascending, it is for God's holy design. It is for his intention. And so we proceeded by saying that if one is to be sanctified, it demands an alteration of one's heart. Our hearts cannot remain the same during that time of sanctification, which speaks specifically to being separated or set apart. So our hearts need to be transformed. It needs to be altered that we will love God. We will not only just love God, but our fellow men. There shall be love for God and love for man. I refer to this as a horizontal love, love from man to man, across the board, man to man speaks of human being. And there is the vertical love, love from man to God and from God to man. And when we are truly sanctified, we have to now change our way of operating. There must be that yearning, that longing in our hearts to change so that we will show forth that love for God and indeed for each other. Tonight, we are looking at sanctification as it pertains to holiness. Sanctification and holiness. We have established, and if you were not there, 
I'll just repeat it for persons who are there. To be sanctified is to be set apart, to be separated, to be placed in a position where you are going to be given that grace to do what is required of you through the, the pushing, through the Holy Spirit as he prepares you, as he prepares us to attain unto holiness so that God will find us fit for his purpose. In other words, a vessel of dishonor should not be found of us or in us. If we need that place to you know, where we are gods and God uses us, then we ought to be set apart. We need to be holy unto God. Our holiness is not of self. We cannot in our own, um, on our own merit of our own self, our own doing, become holy. We are human beings with a mindset that is uh, prone to destruction. Everything that the flesh desires is contrary to what the spirit desires. And so our holiness, our separateness, our setting apart, it is only attainable through the working of the Holy Spirit as he prepares us or sanctifies us unto the works or unto the will or unto the purposes of God. And so tonight, it, we are saying that sanctification is also now holiness. When we look at holiness, I have a, a statement here which says, uh, it is impossible to conform for God to conform to a holy standard. It is impossible for God to conform to a holy standard. Why do I say it is impossible for God to conform to a holy standard? Because God is the standard. When you speak of conforming, you are talking about changing from something to become something. God cannot change. He is holy. He is the, he characterizes holiness. He is the essence of holiness. And so he cannot change. He cannot conform to what he is. That is why we are the ones to conform to the standard of God, because his standard is what it is. It is the standard of holiness. And so we say that sanctification now is synonymous with holiness. It is synonymous with consecration. It is also synonymous with um, to be sanctified and holy. In that, when we look at <clears throat> sanctification and we say it is synonymous to each of these terms, what are we saying here? Holiness, consecration, and these words, when we look at them, we are all thinking holiness. To live in a way that is worthy of God's purpose. God will sanctify an individual unto holiness so that his standard will be recognized in that person. Let me use the word separate. God will separate an individual and cause that person to attain holiness so that person will ascend to his standard. Then and only then can that person be recognized as a sanctified vessel unto God. His standards are such that he cannot lie. That is why we say he cannot conform and he is the standard. He cannot lie. He cannot, he cannot do wrong. God cannot, he's not man. There is no evil to be found in God. God makes no mistakes. His judgments are righteous. There is no darkness, no evil in God. He does absolutely nothing wrong. And based on those facts and those truths, we can say without a doubt that God is the ultimate standard when we think of holiness. Why so? Holiness now says 
it is uh, the character of the being. It is uh, your character that God wants to change, to ascribe or send to his. When we speak of um, consecration, we are talking about setting something apart by offering it to God. I consecrate a certain thing. It could be whatever it is that you deem worthy to be used of God, by God, it will be sanctified unto him. God may just say to you, I need you to sanctify that vessel. That vessel is not necessarily a vessel that is something you handle. It is not necessarily a, a pot. The vessel may very well be your body because our bodies are the vessels of the Lord. And so God may ask that you sanctify that vessel, his vessel, consecrate it unto him, set it apart for his, for his desire. When we speak of uh, sanctifying now, is, uh, to be sanctified is to be set apart. Holy now uh, speaks of a uh, location, I recall in the Bible where Jesus went and he took everything that the, the men who were selling at, at the church, the building, the temple, when they were there carrying out their merchandise, Jesus went and he threw everything. There was a righteous indignation that erupted in him. He said, his father's house is not a den of thieves. His father's house shall be called a house of prayer. And it upset him that this place, that location that needed to be set apart unto holiness was being used as a place for commodity or transactions to be taking place. And so this was, you know, annoying to him. And you saw anger rising out of Jesus. It's one of the places where we, we seldom saw Jesus becoming angry to that extent. And when he saw that place which was supposed to have been set apart, a place that was supposed to be holy, being, you know, it being polluted by the persons or the people of the time when they decided to sell their merchandise at that place, you know, he became upset, angry. There was absolute righteous indignation that came forth out of Jesus, unlike his, you know, very calm demeanor where he hardly spoke. He simply said things in parables when you look at the Bible. Now, a place, a holy can be a thing. Any paraphernalia can be used as something that is set apart. In the days of old men used the chalice that was set apart for God from which the oil flow. This was the par paraphernalia used for the time. A person can be set apart for God's purpose. So we have people who are set apart. There are persons they call themselves monks. They have sanctified themselves unto their God. And they understand that these men, they, their lives are such that they do not enter into any kind of, um, or they, I wouldn't say they do not come into, but they avoid at all costs every kind of physical or, or, or fleshly, you know, behavior to the point that they live a life of isolation and they have taken their sanctification to another level. Sadly, I do not see Christians with that determination that I see from the monks who say that they are going to set themselves apart unto their God. And so persons now are, are called to be set apart for God. Thanks be to God, he's not as, you know, um, is not as brutal as, as the monks who follow their, their, you know, belief. We have also a person who has been set apart or has been blessed, is deemed to be holy. So God can set a person apart and he does set people apart for his own sake. Now, here it is, um, when we have connected to God, when we have uh, holiness coming out of us, when we are consecrated unto God, when we are sanctified, we are saying all in all that we are trying our best, not in our own flesh, for we put flesh under subjection, but we are availing ourselves, at it, as it were, to be used by God, to be set apart for the purposes of God. And so tonight we continue in that vein as we look at sanctification as it relates to holiness. 
sanctification as it relates to holiness. Sanctification sets believers apart and it, enable, it enables the filling of the Holy Spirit. When an individual is sanctified, the Holy Spirit now is able to fill that individual. The Holy Spirit now has everything now that is in place because that individual has given himself or given herself unto sanctification. So now the body, that person's vessel is ready, conducive to receive that Holy Spirit who is waiting. He is waiting to fill us. And so how do we now get ourselves in a place or position for the Holy Holy Spirit to fill us during that process or that time when we have been sanctified unto holiness. When we have no unconfessed sins in our life, we are going to be filled with the Spirit of God. And it is then that God is going to accept us. Are there sinful things that we harbor? There are things in our lives that we have yet to confess. We have not given up on certain things. We are holding on and we have failed to release it. We are making it hard for the Holy Spirit to fill us because there are certain sinful habits that we are holding on to. For our sanctification to give way for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, every sinful deed that is worthy to be placed under our feet, so that the accuser of the brethren cannot hold anything against us and accuse us and has any legal rights to you take us before the father and accuse us of things that we have we have harbored in our hearts that we have done and we hold in that secret and we are afraid others would know because we feel that if others know what we have done, then we will look terrible in their sight. It is better that you look bad in the sight of man than you look bad in the sight of God. And so I would ask and urge us, if we want the Holy Spirit to fill us as we are going through the process and as we are going through that time of sanctification, let our confession be that nothing in us will give the enemy legal rights to accuse us. As believers, we are positionally righteous. I will go into that later on down the road so you will understand what positionally righteous signifies. We are also sanctified always. That is a bold statement that will be dealt with later on. We are practically righteous. Bear those terms in your mind. And we, and we are sanctified only when we are walking in the spirit. We are only sanctified when we are walking in the spirit. Flesh and spirit have absolutely nothing in common. And so our sanctification requires and demands that we put flesh under subjection and we allow the Holy Spirit to have his free way in our lives. Sanctification enables holiness or consecration and connected to worship. The word holy is used mainly in connection with worship. God, we have said, is the essence of holiness. His attributes are absolutely and exclusively holy. Everything about God is holy. There is no vile in God. There is no evil in God. God is holy. We are told, be he holy, for I am holy. When we are coming before this holy God, our connection is worship. The angels who are seated in heaven, we are told in the book of Revelations 4.8, the angels worship him and they echo, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The four beasts had each of them with their six wings around him. 
and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night. So when we look at sanctification, we are saying that it's con it is connected to worship. Can you imagine day and night, the four beasts, the angels, the elders, they are always saying, speaking, exerting. They are echoing the holiness of God. They are saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So sanctification is connected to worship. When we are worshiping God, we have entered into that place of sanctification. When we are worshiping God, we have entered into this place of sanctification. When we say holy, when we say, say holy unto the Lord, what we are actually saying is that God, who is like unto you, mighty God? There is no other God like you. There is no other who personifies your, God, your godliness or your holiness. There is no other who personifies that attribute of holiness. When we worship him, it is in reference to his holiness. So do not take your worship lightly. Your worship unto God is a moment of sanctification. There are persons who trivialize worship and do not see the importance of worshiping even in church. There is a worship moment and you, you are just there, your eyes are shut, thinking of your meal because your belly is rumbling. And you know, you are thinking of your Sunday mac and cheese that you have there and your probably your, your oxtail and your rice and whatever it is for the Sunday meal. And your, your worship is really and truly one of annoyance and haste. But what you don't realize that during that time of worship, this is when the heaven opens and the glory cloud comes in because God inhabits the praise, the worship of his people. So when we are worshiping God, this is a moment where we may see the things we are asking of God coming forth. Even in that time and in that place, God is not going to hold back what he has for us. So in Exodus 15, 11, it is said, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? So here in this uh, scripture, you saw that these men recognize that in that place of worship, wonders were happening. <laughs> or they may have worship after the wonders had taken place, but God inhabits his people and there is a place of holiness. There is a place of sanctification that God says, this is what I require. I have asked nothing of you, but you worship me. And so when we speak of holiness, sanctification, connection to these two words or being set apart is the word worship. I urge us tonight, do not trivialize our worship or take it lightly. It is a moment to be sanctified. It is a moment to set apart unto God. Sanctification unto holiness conveys the following ideas. A separation, dedication, purification, consecration, and service. I'm going to delve into each of them separately as we try to understand how these are going to, you know, show for holiness. We are saying that sanctification unto holiness enables separation. What happens during that time? When we speak of holy, it speaks of the divine nature of God. Its root meaning is separation. So holiness speaks of God himself. When the Holy One will use a person objective in his, or object in his service, what he's doing is separating that person. God wants to separate us unto himself, unto holiness. The separation means that certain things God will say put apart. He's going to set it apart. God separates man, woman, child, or uh, adult, wherever they are, from a common man. 
unto an uncommon man for his use. So can you imagine, I recall listening to a man who could not read and write. And he said one day, he, he had never gone to school. His only schooling was listening to people talk about school. And he learned about school from them talking about school. And one day he said he took a Bible and by some miraculous means, this common person who had never read and wrote, written anything started reading. So when God sanctifies you, he's going to make that common person, that person whom the builder will reject. He's going to make an uncommon person out of you for his use. And by virtue of this separation, the person of the object that he will separate will become holy. So do not discard those around us who do not seem to be carrying anything. Sanctification unto holiness does yet another thing. It empowers dedication. In, uh, when we look at sanctification, let me go to what we are saying here. Let me, forgive me, let me um, just take a look at this. A man becomes holy. Let me just ponder on this for a little while. That man's holiness, as I go back to it, it is not, as I have said, as a result of his own doing. God is the one who does it. The Holy Spirit is the one who does it. And so when you become an uncommon person, you are commoner and you become an extraordinary person. It is because God has chosen, identified, set you apart. But that setting apart, it is not for one to become boastful. It is not for one to beat his chest and say, look what the Lord has done. Look at who I am. I am that or I am it. It is for his own purpose. It is for his holiness. And so one needs to be humble even then. Even then. Sanctification unto holiness empowers dedication. What does that mean? When one is dedicated or sanctified, it includes both a separation from, separation from, and a dedication to. What am I being separated from when I am being dedicated? Separated from sin. Separated from everything that will keep us from God. Everything that is contending with our righteousness. Remember, we did that last week. Our righteousness is only found in Christ. So everything that is fighting Christ in us, not Christ, but fighting the character of Christ in us. So we ought to be separated from sins during that time of dedication. And we are going to be dedicated to God. It is the condition of believers as they are separated from sin and from the world and made partakers of the divine nature and consecrated to fellowship and the service of God through the mediator. Who is the mediator? The mediator himself is Christ. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, we are told, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man and the mediator Christ Jesus. We obtain, because of the mediation from the mediator, we obtain mercy through Jesus, our mediator, Heather, without him violating the eternal law of justice. There is an eternal law of justice. We are worthy of every punishment for every sin that we have committed. But Jesus, our mediator, when he intercedes or he comes before us and he goes rather goes before the father on our behalf, crying for mercy on the basis of his blood, Jesus is not violating the eternal law of justice because of our atrocious acts. But what he's doing, he's simply asking God, 
forgive them, Father. Remember not their sin, Father. Was my blood not worth it? Did I not take on their punishment? And he mediates on our behalf. And so not because he's mediating, we need to continue in our sins. If we have been separated from the worldly things and from sin and that being dedicated to God, then our posture during that time is to recognize that we are set apart for God and we make our election sure by remaining on our knees and saying, I know what awaits me and I am not going to forfeit it. In Hebrews 8, 6, it is said, but now, have we ob he obtained a more excellent ministry by how also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And so whatever we deserve as our punishment, because Jesus has gone as our mediator ahead of us to the Father, then we are sanctified unto holiness through that action of mediation we are proceeding as we are dedicated we see holiness expresses the thought that man or woman or thing anything it is that god decides to use are used in god's service and dedicated to him in a special sense as his property brothers and sisters you and me you and I, we are the property of God, his holy property. Do not fool yourself and run around the place looking for another. You belong to God. We belong to God. Israel is a, a holy nation because it was dedicated to the service of God. Yes, Israel the Bible speaks of Israel, the people whom God loves, how he yearned and longed to draw them under his wings, just like a mother hen draws its little ones, you know, under his arm. So Israel as well has been dedicated to God. Dedication as it expresses holiness, we see the Levites were holy because they were specially dedicated to the service of the tabernacle. Um, I, I looked at that and I, a lot of questions came through my mind as I deviate slightly. I, I look at um, in certain um, religions when uh, a child is dedicated to God, a child is dedicated to God and uh, the child grows and the child that goes nowhere beyond that moment of dedication. And it is believed that this child has been used by God. And that child is God's property. Yet the child does everything and there is no baptism other than that dedication, which is called a baptism. I ask myself then, is there an error in that practice? Is there an error in that practice? I, for, um, I will not uh, hit any religion, but if you know of religions, you'd understand which one I'm probably referring to here. The Levites were holy because they were specially dedicated to the service of the tabernacle. Yes, they were supposed to be priests in the tabernacle. They were set apart for the service of God. And we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 31 that says, Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now we have consecrated your, or we, now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come ye and bring sacrifices and thanks offerings into the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings. And as many as were of a free heart burnt offerings. And so you saw that these people didn't just bring themselves. They also brought of their substances. They came to thank God even while they were being sanctified unto the Lord. I see the Levites having a, a heart that they did it freely. It was, they were not coerced into doing it. They were not forced into doing it. And so when one is now being set apart for 
oh God, that in Asia, last week I said, we have to collaborate and work in a, a, you know, closely with God to in our process or during the time of sanctification. And so when people now take on that challenge and they say, I am going to do it, I will do it willfully, then it will be nothing to give of their all. And so we saw the Levites demonstrating that. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 34, it is said, but the priests were too few so that they could not fly all the burnt offerings. Wherefore, the brethren, the Levites, did help, help them until the, the work was ended and until the other priests had sacrificed themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. Now, this one, it, it hits me. The Levites were more upright in heart than the priest this one is for another study that one how can a man of the cloth who is supposed to be sanctified unto god a priest in that sanctified place and those who are not called priests their hearts were more upright that one is one to ponder upon huh I love what I'm seeing here because they never wash their clothes. They never sanctify their clothes. Hmm. Interesting. Holiness expresses the thought that the Sabbath and the feast days were holy because of the dedication or consecration of time. So when you are going to church, my brothers and sisters, this is a holy moment. This is a time dedicated unto holiness. In second, in I'm um, sorry, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I think there is a lot of misconception about that little scripture. And people make a lot of noise over it. But I'm seeing here the Sabbath and feast. There were several Sabbaths. And if we study the Bible, we'll notice it was not only uh, whatever was looked upon as the Sabbath or Sabbath. There were so many things that were referred to as Sabbath. So there were feasts and there were Sabbaths which were sanctified or dedicated unto God as it was consecrated unto him. We proceed in as we look at sanctification and to holiness. And we're saying that holiness is separation to service and it engenders purification. So when one is being sanctified unto holiness, there has to be a process of purification. Purification is an act whereby impurities are removed from something, from a person or a location. There is a cleansing of that vessel the process involves making that thing spiritually clean. When one is being sanctified unto holiness, you must be purified. You cannot be sanctified with that same dirty vessel. Every filth that is found in that vessel has to be removed. Because when you are entering into that place of holiness, God is separating you unto himself to become holy. Whatever you are carrying, we are carrying. Whatever garbage that is found within us must be burnt away. Then and only then can God see that we are now willing and ready and abled vessels, willing now to be set apart or sanctified through our process or through our willingness to be purified. Jehovah's character reacted upon whatever was devoted to him. Hear this, God's character reacted upon whatever was devoted to him. I am going to liken that up unto oil and water. If I pour oil in water, Assuming Jehovah's character is water. If we are not sanctified or purified, there will be a separation. 
It does not matter how much oil you put in the water. The oil will automatically just be at the top of that water. There will be no sinking. There will be no mixing because there are impurities in that vessel. Now, on the other hand, we are the salt of the earth. When Jehovah now, the salt of salts, is poured into a purified vessel, I'm using this as a, just an example, then there is what is called a mixture. We now begin to take on that very character. So his character upon us will cause a reaction. We become thoroughly mixed. And so we cannot tell the difference between the salt and the water. Because now the salt begins to taste like the water. Or the water begins to taste like the salt. And so now what you have is a total immersion. You have a connection. You have an agreement. And you have something that is inseparable. Unless, of course, you apply some heat and some processes to remove the salt from the water. And even then, you will not get the salt at um, the full amount of salt that you originally had. So filth, I see, homosexuality must be removed. Lesbianism must be removed. Theft must be removed. Lies, all those things that are going to cause us to be dirty. Every nastiness must be removed. We have to be purified so that we can be used by God. His nature can rest upon us. So when we are dedicated to him, we must now begin to resemble him. Our nature must begin to reflect his nature. When we are purified from all filth, we are now going to begin to speak as he speaks. What enters our air gates will not be filth from the media. We are not going to speak like the ordinary person because we can no longer be the same. We put to death the old man during that process of purification. That old man must die. And we must allow the power and the fire of the Holy Ghost to drive away and to burn away every dross, every impurity, every filth, every nastiness. So when now this old man is crucified and the Holy Spirit now kills everything that does not resemble godliness, then we can say now we are purified unto righteousness, unto holiness. We are sanctified unto holiness through that purification. Things devoted to him must be clean. Things devoted to him must be clean. Yes, prophet, fasting is the sword that kills our old man. So now we are going to fast from everything that is filthy. And we are going to feast on the word we are going to feast on everything that is of God. But during that time, we must remain in the presence of God. Sanctification now, as we are being sanctified and we are being purified unto that place of holiness, God will select and separate a person or object for his service. He does something or causes some, um, something to be done for that person or object to be holy. Sometimes it is the most difficult thing and the most lonely thing when you are being purified. Imagine every day you have to die to certain things. Certain habits and behaviors must die. As God is selecting and separating these things, now that thing begins to shine. If you think of how a jeweler makes a chain, he takes a raw piece of element, a piece of gold element, and it goes through the process of purification through the fire. Sometimes our purification will bring us to the fiery furnace of God and things in us must die and be burnt away. It can be very, very hard. It can be very painful and lonely. But the process is worth it because at the end of that process 
when we are being purified through the furnace of fire, we will come out shining. The glory of our Father is going to be seen upon us. We cannot remain the same once we have gone through that purification process. When we have been burnt and tried, nothing in us can remain the same. As a matter of fact, during that process, we will even find out that things in us we didn't even knew or we didn't know existed will be coming out. Can you imagine? I remember a very um, sophisticated young lady. She looks like she has it all on her shoulders and God was really working through her. And this girl started kicking chairs in church. My goodness, her hair that was always on point, not one strand was out of order. By the time God was finished with her, her hair was all over the place. This very well put together young lady, I remember her screaming and mighty God of Daniel, you had to quickly grab, grab a robe and put it all over her so her, you know, her, her creations would not be revealed to the public. And so this young lady, after she was, you know, she was torn apart, she was stretched out and everything came out of her, every filth. You would have never thought so because of the outward appearance. You know, I saw that as an example. She is now walking and she's a changed person. I do not see the same person anymore. As a matter of fact, I don't even really recognize her anymore because of that change that she went through, through her purification process. Inanimate objects are consecrated by being anointed with oil. Yes, in Exodus 24, 8, we see that the Israelites, the nations, were sanctified by the blood of the covenant and the sacrifice. In Leviticus chapter 8, the entire chapter, the priests were sanctified by God's representative. Moses, he washed them with water, anointed them with oil and sprinkle them with the blood of consecration. So when we are being consecrated, there are certain things that will happen. In some cases, we will be told, look, I would need you to stay away from the public. Go into a place of hiding for a few days. I think it is in the book of Ezekiel when God called him unto consecration. He was given some strange instructions and he was, he was lamenting the hardness of that process. And so God will call us to be sanctified and he will wash us. And as he does, uh, what we are going to experience will be very disheartening. We must remain focused and we must remain on par with what God is doing as he sanctifies us and purifies us. Everything in us will be removed everything in us will be removed. We are proceeding here as we continue. We are seeing sanctification when God sanctified the sons of Aaron. He sanctified the sons of Aaron to the priesthood through the meditation of Moses, of the mediation rather of Moses and by means of water, oil and blood. These are three of the, the things that um, these are three of the things that God would use when He's sanctifying others: water, blood, and oil. No wonder that church I spoke of earlier, they'll take a bit of water, sprinkle it on the children's head, and they are saying, I am dedicating that child to God. And that is the fullness of that child's dedication unto God. God the Father. Likewise, sanctifies believers to spiritual priesthood. God the Father, likewise, will sanctify believers unto spiritual priesthood. Tonight, I take it that we have been sanctified unto holiness. As I bring tonight's teaching to an end, there is much to be said, but I will stop at this point and it will be continued in a subsequent Bible study. I would like to thank you for listening attentively 
may we all be purified as we are sanctified unto God. God bless you. Over to you, Prophet Bernard.